Okay, so what happened um, Wednesday is we, we went over the logistics of how the class is gonna work, and we started walking our way around the wall chart, and as usual, I didn't finish. So I think what I was talking about when we finished Wednesday was the distinction between nuclear fission and nuclear fusion, and I asked you to think about you know, how it is we can get energy out of both fission and fusion, and we'll hopefully answer that question today. Okay, so just to continue the tour, um, one of the things that's been discovered um, through nuclear science, and one thing I have to keep emphasizing throughout the course, is this is an experimental science, okay? This isn't something where you just sit down with a piece of paper and a pencil or a computer and figure it all out, okay? It's amazingly complicated, uh, partly because nuclei are composite objects. Um, and what this is, is a representation of all the nuclei that have been discovered so far. There are about 3,000 of them, and that represents different combinations of neutrons and protons. And they're organized into something analogous to the periodic table, except this is a nuclear chart. And what's being plotted here on the horizontal axis is the number of neutrons in a given nucleus, and the vertical axis is the number of protons, and each one of these boxes represents a particular isotope uh, of a particular chemical element. And what is found is that there is a structure to this table, again analogous to the structure that was seen in the periodic table, in certain combinations of neutrons and protons are more stable than others. Uh, just like the noble gases have a closed shell of electrons and therefore they are chemically inert, a similar thing happens with nuclei, that when you have certain numbers of either neutrons or protons, those nuclei are more inert than their neighbors, meaning they are more resistant to radioactive decay or uh, more resistant to nuclear reactions changing them. Sorry, before I go any further, um, I know the class is crowded. I think there's a classroom across the way that has chairs. Just go drag a chair out of there and bring it in here. I'm sorry, we should do that. I don't want to have to have people sitting on the floor. Um, right, so some nuclei are more stable than others, and the closed shells are called magic numbers, and we'll talk about this later. But for example, two is a magic number. So if you have a nucleus that has two protons in it, uh, that's more stable than one that has one or three. And helium-4, which we've talked about already in the context of alpha decay, has two protons and two neutrons. It's what's called doubly magic. It's got a magic number of neutrons and a magic number of protons, and so it's really, really stable. And then as you work up your way in the, the chart of the nuclides, 20, 28, 50, 82, 126 turn out to be magic numbers, meaning they're closed shells of either neutrons or protons. There you go. And um, one of the questions that puzzled people for a while is why is it those numbers? What, what's special about those numbers and how do we understand them? And we get to talking about the shell model, we'll see we can understand why those numbers are what they are. So there are about 3,000 nuclei that are shown there. Each one of those dots represents a different nucleus. They're color-coded by the way they decay. The black ones sort of in the middle are the stable nuclei. So of those 3,000 that are known, only about 200 are stable. Those are the ones you dig up out of the ground and measure. The other ones are all synthetic. Uh, the ones to the right of the black dots are ones that undergo primarily beta minus decay that we talked about the other day. And the ones that are to the left of the black dots undergo either positron decay or electron capture. Uh, and the ones up near the top are the ones that are mainly undergo the alpha decay that we also talked about. Um, now you might think that you know, nuclear physics may be interesting here on Earth, but it doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the universe. In fact, nuclear physics has played a role in the entire history of our universe, from the very beginning up in And this part of the chart is meant to illustrate that, that our universe, we believe, is about 15 billion years old, and it started in a very hot, dense event known as the Big Bang, shown over there on the left. And at that point, the universe was very, very hot and very, very dense. Uh, so hot and dense that atoms didn't exist, nuclei didn't exist, even neutrons and protons didn't exist because the temperatures and densities were too high. And that very hot, dense universe began expanding, and as it expanded, the density dropped and the temperature dropped, and eventually it went through a period where these particles I talked about the other day, quarks, existed as free objects. Uh, there was something known as the quark gluon plasma, uh, one of the things we'll talk about later on is the notion that the way 
particles interact with one another is by exchanging other particles. Okay? So the reason that an electron and a proton attract each other via the Coulomb force is not action at a distance. It's not some magic thing that they know about each other. It's actually that they're exchanging photons back and forth all the time. And that exchange of the photons is what leads to that attraction. And similarly, we believe that what holds the quarks inside the neutrons and protons is another particle called the gluon. And that the quarks are shooting gluons back and forth between each other, and that's what holds them together. And so there was a period of time, maybe uh, a microsecond or so after the Big Bang, when the whole universe consisted as this plasma of quarks and gluons. And eventually that plasma continued to expand and cool, and it got cold enough that groups of three quarks could get together and form neutrons and protons. And so that's what happened over here when the universe was maybe a few microseconds old and the temperature had dropped all the way down to 10 to the 12th Kelvin. Okay? That's still too hot for nuclei to exist, so the universe had to wait a little um, something like three minutes. There's a famous textbook by Steven Weinberg called The First Three Minutes, and this is what he's talking about. About three minutes after the Big Bang happened, the universe's temperature was about a million Kelvin, and at that point, sorry, a billion Kelvin, and at that point, the temperature is low enough that neutrons and protons can start coalescing and forming heavy nuclei. Now, it turns out it doesn't go very far, but in those first three minutes, all the hydrogen and almost all the helium in the universe that we see today was produced. But it doesn't go any further than that. As the temperature continues to cool, eventually neutral atoms can form. Electrons can bind to these nuclei and make neutral atoms. That happens about 100,000 years after the Big Bang. And from that point on, you've got neutral atoms which are expanding, forming stars, planets, and so on. But these stars, we're going to find out, make their energy through nuclear reactions. So the point is that they're nuclear reactions that have been going on through the whole course of uh, the universe's history. And one of the things we'd like to do is by studying these reactions in the laboratory, try to understand the processes that have happened throughout history to produce the material that we see today. Um, I've already alluded to the fact that there are these different phases of nuclear matter. So in analogy to ordinary matter, like water, so water at room temperature is a liquid, but you know if you cool it, it turns into ice, it becomes a solid. And similarly, if you heat it up enough, it turns into a gas, it becomes steam. It turns out nuclei behave the same way. Uh, to a very good approximation, the nuclei that we normally deal with are sitting in their ground states or very low-lying excited states. And that nuclear matter behaves very much like a charged liquid. It's a very, very dense, uh, and it has an electric charge, but in many ways it behaves like an incompressible liquid. And so this is a phase diagram of density and temperature for nuclei. And normally we're talking about nuclear densities in this range and low temperatures. So normal nuclei are in this lower left-hand corner of that phase diagram. But astrophysically, different conditions exist in different locations. So in particular, there are these objects we'll talk about later called neutron stars, which are very, very dense. They're actually one of the death products of uh, stellar evolution. Uh, they're very, very dense, very, very cold. So they occupy this part of the, the density temperature chart. Whereas the early universe I was talking about a minute ago, the Big Bang, is up in the upper left-hand corner. And so what we think happens is that when you either cool or heat nuclei, you can change them from liquids to gas or even further decompose them into this quark gluon plasma. Now, that's another version of the same plot over here. And again, this is something we don't just theorize, we try to study experimentally. And so at the Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island, there is an accelerator which accelerates heavy nuclei like gold or lead to very, very high energies, relativistic kinetic energies, uh, in a very big facility called RIC, the Relativistic Heavy Ion Collider. And what it does is it produces a beam, let's say, of uh, gold nuclei that are all going counterclockwise in the ring, and another beam of gold all going clockwise in the ring, and periodically they intersect one another, and scientists have built enormous detectors to study the interactions of these colliding gold nuclei. So gold has one isotope, 197, so here's gold, the chemical symbol is AU, what makes gold gold is that it has 79 protons in its nucleus, 
and the one stable isotope of gold has an atomic mass of 197, so there should be 197 minus 79 neutrons, which is what, 100 and... Arithmetic right? Is that right? Okay, so that's how many neutrons and protons there are. When these two nuclei smash head on, you can imagine that's a very, very violent collision. Uh, these things have enormous energies. They, they run these uh, beams at something like 100 uh, GeV per atomic mass unit. This is 10 to the 9th EV. Very, very high energy. And they look for collisions where the two gold nuclei basically hit head on. Now, one thing you might think would happen is perhaps when these nuclei collide that violently, you totally disassemble the gold in into its constituent parts, namely the 79 protons and 118 neutrons. So what you might think the most um, catastrophic kind of reaction you would see is these two guys would come together and out would come two times 197 particles, okay, or about 400 particles. Well, this is an image of one such collision. Each one of these tracks represents a particle that came out of that collision. The way this image is taken is there's a beam that was going into the board and another beam coming out of the board and the intersection point was right there, okay? Now, it's hard to see how many individual tracks there are in that picture, but my colleagues up at LBL who do this for a living tell me there are about 10,000 tracks in that picture, okay? So not only did they totally disassemble both of the gold nuclei, they made about 10,000 additional particles, okay? Those particles were not in the initial gold nuclei. They were produced as a result of that collision, and that's another example of this Einstein relationship. So there was an enormous amount of energy available there, and most of it got turned into particles. These turn out to be like electrons, positrons, pions, kaons, the whole zoo of what used to be called fundamental particles. And by studying those kind of tracks, they're trying to figure out what were the initial conditions right after that collision and see if, in fact, they formed this quartz gluon plasma. And it looks like they did. It looks like they've been able to recreate the conditions that probably existed in the first microsecond of our universe at this accelerator. And there are further experiments going on there, and there's another accelerator that you probably read about in the paper that had some problems earlier this year called the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, uh, which is designed to study these things in even more detail. So the point is that this is an experimental science. We don't know everything, okay? You guys are going to help us figure this out, but it's an evolving science. Um, so I'm going to switch back to lower energy nuclear science now, and this goes back to that nuclear wall chart, and what we've done is blown up a portion of it near the upper right-hand corner. So these are the so-called man-made or synthetic elements, the ones beyond uranium and thorium. So these don't occur naturally. We make them at accelerators like the 88 inch cyclotron up at LBL. This is a photograph of one of the labs we'll go visit later in the semester where this work is actually done. And one of the things that was done there is to produce what, at the time we made this wall chart, the heaviest known element, element 112. So two relatively heavy nuclei were fused together. And after that, um, the decays of element 112 were observed by observing the alpha decays that were emitted by these, these nuclei. And each one of these boxes represents a nucleus that was produced when the element 112 nucleus underwent alpha decay. So 112 turned into 110, which turned into 108, 106, and so on. And by measuring the energies of those alphas and the time between emission of the alphas, they're able to infer which nucleus it was and build up uh, the nuclear chart that way. Um, as I indicated the other day, now uh, these studies have been uh, progressed up to element 118, and there's an experiment that'll happen later this year which is designed to look for element 120. Now you might say, who cares? Um, there are a couple of good answers to that. One is, getting back to the chemistry, we'd like to understand how chemical um, properties of the elements evolve as we go heavier and heavier. And you might think, well, you know, this all must be very well known because what's chemistry? It's just rearrangement of electrons, and we know about electrons. And that's true, but it turns out that in these very, very heavy nuclei, the electrons are bound ever more tightly because the Z of the nucleus keeps going up. And the electrons become relativistic, which we'll talk about a little bit more today. That complicates things and changes the atomic structure and thereby the chemistry in ways which are not totally predictable. 
So there's a lot of interest in the chemistry of these things. And furthermore, we'd like to understand these so-called neutron and proton magic numbers as we go heavier and heavier. Uh, I indicated that number 126 is a magic number. That's been observed experimentally to be true for neutrons. We don't know if it's true for protons because we don't have element 126 yet. We'd like to figure that out. And we're wondering if, in fact, if you got to element 126, whether that nucleus would be extra stable. In fact, maybe stable, absolutely stable, or at least much longer lived than the other nuclei nearby. Uh, you can't read these things very well, but these have lifetimes on the order of fractions of a second. But it could be if you got to 126, it might live a million years or so, which would make it a lot more interesting for, for all kinds of studies. So there's a lot of work on this still going on. Um, I warned you the other day about neutrinos, and so here it comes again. Um, you're going to find out later on when we talk about nuclear fusion that nuclear fusion doesn't just happen in the lab, it happens in every star. And in fact, stars like our sun produce all of their energy through the fusion of hydrogen into helium. Okay, so it's not a chemical reaction, it's not uh, like you're burning hydrogen chemically, you're burning it in a nuclear way. Very schematically, what happens is four protons combine to make one helium-4 nucleus, um, and like we were talking the other day, a helium-4 nucleus and compared its mass to the mass of the four protons, what you would find is the helium-4 weighs a little bit uh, That means energy is generated. It's an exothermic nuclear reaction when that happens. Um, you take two protons and turn them into two neutrons, and remember the neutron has no electric charge, and Norman said the other the charge is absolutely conserved. So we better have two positively charged objects emitted. Those are those little blue balls, the positrons. And to conserve angular momentum and linear momentum. Now this was figured out in about 1939 by a bright man named Hans Bethe, okay? Based on very little experimental evidence. Um, the problem is you day today it's really bright you see a lot of energy coming from it but you can't tell that this is the origin of it and part of the reason for that is those nuclear reactions are happening way down in the core of the Sun uh, where the temperature is about Kelvin and the density is about 150 times the density of water we can't look directly in there with those photons the photons that we see are coming from the surface of the Sun and they've long lost any memory of how they were created but one of the interesting things about neutrinos is they are very, very weakly interacting with matter. Um, and again, I'll probably say this half a dozen times in the course of the semester. A neutrino like this can literally travel through a light year of lead. Okay, so you have a slab of lead, a light year thick, and a neutrino that has an energy on the order of an MeV like these do, it'll go right through that. It didn't, it. it's not that it's somehow weaving and missing yet, it's going right through it. Okay, it's because neutrinos interact incredibly weakly with matter. On the other hand, what that means is they come right out of the sun, the sun at almost the same. Um, and so if we could to see neutrinos and tell that they actually came from we'd be looking into the core of the sun to verify whether this is right or not. And over the last 20 years, we've built detectors to do exactly that. This is one of them. This is called the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory up in Canada. And what you can't see very well is in the center here, there's uh, a big tank, a spherical tank, that held 1,000 tons of a particular kind of water called heavy water. And this is located two kilometers underground in a nickel mine in Canada. Do these experiments underground to filter out all the background radiation that would interfere with this. So those two kilometers of rock. So if you see something down there, you're pretty sure it really was a neutrino. Flashes of light produced when the neutrinos interacted with that heavy wall. What looks like sort of the eye of a fly out here is actually an array of 10,000 multiple those little flashes of light in there. And in fact, this experiment and a similar one that happened in Japan proved that uh, we could see that they actually pointed back to where the sun was in the sky and verified that this is the model of what's happening in the sun. And kind of unexpectedly, we also learned that neutrinos are a lot more interesting and a lot more interesting than we originally thought, because what should be produced in the sun 
are these kind of neutrinos that are somehow associated with electrons. As we'll see later on, there are three other kinds of neutrinos. And by the time they get from the sun to us, two-thirds of them are the wrong kind of neutrinos. They started out as electron type. They turned into these other types. And that, the only way that can happen is if neutrinos have mass. And this is one of the outcomes of these experiments. But it's all based on low energy nuclear physics. Um, OK, now this is a nuclear engineering class, after all. And so why is it we care about this? Well, this is a little bit of examples of where nuclear science plays a role in industry and in other applications. We'll spend a little bit of time uh, later in the year talking about medical applications. Uh, radioisotopes get used for all kinds of things, for imaging what's going on inside our bodies, for treating cancer, uh, for all kinds of different things. And we'll talk about how these isotopes get produced, what it is about each isotope that makes it useful for this kind of application, and how the applications are actually carried out. Uh, environmental studies, there are all kinds of studies done using radioisotopes as tracers to figure out how things migrate through the environment. Uh, concerned about what we do with nuclear waste. There are whole classes on that subject here. Um, we'd like to know what happens if we bury the waste at Yucca Mountain or at WIP or some other facility. Is it going to stay there? Is it going to move around? What happens to it? So there are lots of issues there. Um, space, so I've talked about the astrophysics, but there are more practical applications. Um, yesterday I was over at the um, California Academy of Sciences, and they showed a very nice uh, planetarium show, and they had images from the Cassini spacecraft. So this is a satellite that was launched about 10 years ago, and it's now studying Saturn, and it's sending images back to Earth and other data back to Earth. And the question is, you know, how do you supply electrical power to that electronics a billion miles away over a period of 10 or 20 years? And the way it's done is with a nuclear battery, okay? And we'll talk about that later. So that's one of these space applications. Um, another space application which we study up at Lawrence Berkeley Lab is, okay, if you're going to put these complicated electronics on a spacecraft, they're going to be exposed to cosmic rays when they're up there. What's going to happen to those electronic components? How are they going to get damaged by cosmic rays passing through them? We can study that in the lab, we can model it, and so we can design electronics that is more radiation resistant or more radi radiation hard than it otherwise would be, and so it'll function longer. Materials, there are all kinds of materials studies. Um, when we build nuclear power plants, for example, uh, those materials are going to be exposed to enormous amounts of radiation, and we'd like to understand how that material wears as a function of time under this intense radiation bombardment from electrons, from gamma rays, from neutrons, what's it going to do to those materials? Um, furthermore, let's say we're building an automobile. We'd like to understand how long that automobile engine will last before its parts wear out. How do you look inside that engine while it's running? Well, one way it's done is you put radioactive materials into the engine blocks, okay, things that are radioactive that decay in such a way we can see them while the engine's running, and in real time you can monitor how those pistons are doing or how the rings are doing. So lots of applications there. Obviously, nuclear energy is a big focus of why you, you and I are here. So we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about both fission and fusion reactors. Um, also, one of the issues has to do with, you know, again, getting back to this waste issue. Is there a way to get rid of the waste rather than just burying it? And there are ideas on how you could transmute it using nuclear reactions, turning these very long-lived radioactive nuclei that require you know, building facilities that will last thousands or millions of years, uh, turning them into very short-lived activities so you don't have to keep it around so long. And it's actually possible to do that. And then finally, art and archaeology, you might think, what in the world does that have to do with nuclear science? Um, it turns out in almost every major art museum in the world, if you go down to their basement, there's an accelerator. Okay? Uh, a lot of effort is being made into trying to authenticate whether these pieces of art are real or whether they're fakes. Uh, who made them, and a lot of information can be gleaned by looking at the elemental composition of the materials in that painting or in that statue or in that other piece of art. And we use nuclear techniques to do that. Uh, we can date them, we can figure out how old they are from radioactive decay, and we can measure the uh, elemental and sometimes the isotopic composition of those materials to figure out if da Vinci actually painted that thing or not. So this is um, just a little slice of the applications and during the course of the year, we'll go through most of these. But if you have you know, questions or interested, you know, come talk to me about this. OK, conclusion of lecture one. And what I'd like to do is a little set of demonstrations now. Um, because as I said, this is an experiment in science. And 
don't just take my word for it and don't just take the word of you know things you read in the book. It's not necessarily true. We do experiments to figure this stuff out. And what I said the other day about Rutherford was that he was the guy who figured out there were these three different kinds of radioactive decay. And the way he did it is pretty much what I'm going to show you right now, although he didn't have the apparatus we've got. One of the troubles with nuclear science is that you can't see any of this stuff. Okay, we've already talked about how small nuclei and atoms are. You don't see them. Places that can see them for us, okay? And we'll talk about detectors as we go along. This is one of the simplest ones that was built. This is called the Geiger counter, okay? So inside this little head up here is a chamber filled with gas. And what makes the kind of radiation we're talking about dangerous and interesting is it's ionizing radiation. The way it interacts with matter is it rips electrons off of things. So inside this gas, we've got neutral atoms. When it gets exposed to this ionizing radiation, the radiation rips the electrons off the neutral atoms. It creates free electrons and positively charged ions. And also inside this chamber is a little wire, which is at a high voltage. And what happens is the electrons are accelerated toward the wire and collected, and the positively charged ions go the other way and are collected at another electrode. And so you get a current pulse in here every single time a bit of ionizing radiation passes through. And by measuring how many of these uh, clicks you hear, you know how much radiation the detector is being exposed to. So there's a needle here, which is sitting over here, indicating not much is going on. And hopefully you can hear a click every once in a while. Okay? And right now, um, I'm not bringing any of my little toys over there, but it's still clicking. So ionizing radiation is hitting that, even though I'm not deliberately exposing it to anything. What's making it click now? Cosmic rays. So we talked about cosmic rays. These are particles that come in from outer space. Some of them are hitting that. And yes, that's a contribution to that, although that's probably not the major one. What else is going on? Background radiation. OK, right. There is background radiation everywhere. Because you know, I showed you that periodic table and the chart of the nuclides, and we said there are chemical elements on our Earth everywhere from hydrogen up to uranium. Uranium is radioactive. Thorium is radioactive. We didn't talk about it yet, but we'll talk about it later today. There are other isotopes in the middle of that table which occur naturally and are also radioactive. And they are everywhere. So in the walls of this building, in the floor, in our bodies, there are things like potassium-40, which is radioactive. If you like to eat bananas, you've got relatively a lot of it in you. And the potassium is good for us, but on the other hand, it's a little bit radioactive. Uh, the uranium and thorium in the floor are busy undergoing radioactive decay right now. One of the products turns out to be radon, which is a noble gas. It's in the air we're breathing right now. And so all of these things are contributing to those little clicks there. Now, I don't do this to scare you, okay? It's not a dangerous level. In fact, I mean, life has evolved on Earth environment where there is a certain amount of background radiation and in fact there are people who think it's actually necessary for life to be here that life wouldn't have evolved at least in the way it has if that radiation weren't there um, okay so there's background radiation it turns out this detector is capable of seeing all three kinds of radiation alpha beta gamma um, and what I've got over here are sources that emit just one of them at a time okay so we've got a source that only emits alpha particles, another one that only emits betas, and another that only emits gammas. And what I'm going to show you is how Rutherford figured out there were three different kinds. OK. So let's start with alpha, since that was the first one. OK, so this is an isotope called polonium-210. If you go and um, Google it, uh, you'll find lots of interesting information about polonium-210. Um, you might remember a year or two ago, there was a guy over in Russia who was supposedly killed by polonium-210. This is the guy, okay? Uh, a lot more than I've got in my hand, and if you're interested, we can talk about how that all works later. Um, okay, so there are alpha particles coming out of this, and if I bring it over to my detector, okay, it chirps a lot, and the needle basically went off scale. Okay, if you can see it, it's recovering now. So it's going back to baseline, and when I bring it over here, it counts like crazy, okay? That's because alpha particles are coming out of this source, going into the detector, ionizing it, and we're collecting a current pulse. And just to remind you, 
the alpha particle, which Rutherford named it, we now know is a helium-4 nucleus. So it's two protons and two neutrons very tightly bound together because two is a magic number for both protons and neutrons. Okay, so one of the questions is, how much stuff does it take to stop this radiation from reaching the detector? Okay, and I can demonstrate it in two ways. Um, so I'll put the source over there. It counts like crazy. Okay, I've got a piece of paper. Nothing fancy, just an ordinary white piece of paper. I'll put it there and put the source there. Okay, you don't hear it clicking anymore. Okay, uh, that's because a single piece of paper is enough to stop an alpha particle. The other way you can sort of demonstrate this is I put the source here and then I just move it away slowly. I'm about an inch away and it's essentially stopped. So about an inch of air is sufficient to stop an alpha particle. So what does that mean in terms of safety? What about the danger of alpha particles? What would you think that little experiment tells you right away? Don't eat it, very good, don't eat it, okay? That's the issue. If you get it inside your body, that's a bad thing, okay? because there it can damage your organs, okay? So if you breathe it in and it's in your lungs, those alpha particles can directly hit your lung tissue, that's a bad thing. Or if you eat it, it gets into your stomach and your intestines. What about if it's on your skin? What if you, if I were not very careful and I ended up contaminating my hands with it, would that be a problem? Turns out not such a problem. First of all, your skin is quite resistant to radiation as we'll talk about later, but secondly, your skin is thick enough to stop the alpha particles from getting inside your body. So the alpha particles may damage the local region where the contamination is. You might end up with a radiation burn there if you happen to have a lot of it, but it's not gonna deeply uh, damage any of the tissue. So alphas are dangerous if you get them in your body, but if they're outside, they're not so dangerous, not like some of the other kinds of radiation. Okay, so that's alpha particles, they're helium nuclei. Much to stop them, okay? The next kind of radiation is beta. Okay. And the source we've got here is strontium-90. Okay. And we now know that a beta particle is an electron. So what's coming out of here are electrons. Okay. And I bring it over here. And again, it counts like crazy. Okay. Hopefully you saw the needle move. Going back to zero. Counts like crazy. Okay, I'll do the same little demonstration. So I take my piece of paper, I put it there, and they still go right through. So there's something different about that kind of radiation in the alphas, in that a piece of paper isn't enough to stop them. Okay. Now I've got about a quarter of an inch thick piece of plastic. Okay. I've forgotten the name of this stuff, but just ordinary plastic I got out of a machine shop. I put that there, and I put it on there. That pretty much stops it. Okay, not quite, but pretty much. So about a quarter of an inch of plastic is sufficient to stop most betas. Not all of them because, it, as we'll see later on, the amount of material it takes to stop any kind of radiation is a function of the energy of that radiation. And this particular isotope is emitting electrons that go up to about two million electron volts. So if I have a beta source that emits two million electron volt electrons or less, my quarter inch of plastic is fine. But if I had a high energy beta, it might take half an inch or maybe even an inch, but not much more than that, okay? So betas get stopped by about a quarter of an inch of plastic. The third kind of radiation is gamma, okay? And these are photons. These are the same things that are coming out of the light bulb. If I hold this up, Light coming out of there? No, okay? There really are photons, but they're so short in wavelength that our eyes can't see them. Okay, but they're the same basic particle. So I bring it over here, and again, it counts like crazy. And then I do the same thing, so I use my paper. Okay, the gammas go right through the paper. I take my quarter inch of plastic. They still go through, although maybe there are fewer of them. Maybe there isn't chirping quite as fast as it did before, but most of them are still going right through. So they're different than the, the betas. And now I've got a quarter inch of lead, okay? And I put that on there. 
and most of them still go through. Okay? So these are much more penetrating than either the alphas or the betas. In fact, these are really the most dangerous kind of radiation because they go through so much material. So they can penetrate very deeply into your body, even if they're outside, and thereby cause damage to internal organs. So gamma radiation is something you want to avoid, if possible. On the other hand, it's also what gets used a lot for radiation therapy because it is so penetrating. So if you had a tumor deep inside your body, you can shine high-energy photons, gamma rays in, and localize them to the spot where the tumor is and de deliver a radiation dose specifically to that location and damage it and hopefully not damage the surrounding tissue very much. So this is basically what Rutherford did. Um, he didn't have detectors like this. He had other kinds of detectors we'll talk about later. But that's the basic principle. So it's a function of how much material it takes to stop the radiation, which is the major way to classify these. OK, a few more little things. Um, so these are specific radiation sources that you're not going to have around your house, although it turns out anybody who wants to can buy those. They're not licensed or restricted in any way. Are these things around? And again, this is not meant to scare anybody. It's just to sort of show you that there are radioactive things around in our environment and things you might even have at home. Yeah? Did you mention what Oh, sorry, I didn't. So what, what produced that, that's a good, so the question is what uh, isotope was producing the gamma rays there? Well, 60, which is a man-made radioactive isotope. Um, Good question. This will introduce a concept we'll talk about quite a bit later on. So I start making drawings that look like this, where in each one of these lines represents a different nuclear state. So this is cobalt-60 in what we would call a ground state, meaning the lowest energy state possible for the nucleus. It has 27 protons, which is cobalt, and 33 neutrons, which is what makes that cobalt. 60. It turns out that nuclear state is more massive than a state you would get in nickel 60. Nickel 60 would have 28 neutrons and 32, sorry, 28 protons and 32 neutrons. So via the process of beta decay, cobalt 60 could convert itself into nickel 60. So what would happen there is a neutron would turn into a proton which would stay inside the nucleus. So 33 neutrons would become 32, 27 protons would become 28, that would be nickel 60. A beta particle would be and one of these darn electron antineutrinos. It turns out in the decay of cobalt 60, these electrons are very low in energy. And the way that source is made, it's thick enough to stop the betas. So the betas don't get out. So I wasn't cheating when I went over here. Those really were, were photons. But what happens when the beta is emitted is that almost all the time, the nickel 60 is left in an excited state. The beta decay does not proceed to the ground state of nickel 60. It proceeds to an excited state, which then decays and emits these two gamma rays. And it's those two gamma rays which that detector was actually observing. Okay? And the two gamma rays are what took you know, a fair bit of lead to stop. Okay, any other questions about that stuff? Okay, so how many of you know what this stuff is? Fiesta ware. Okay, so you've seen it before. Um, this was a very popular kind of pottery. In fact, it still is sold, uh, but not in this color, okay? Because what makes this color so nice is it's uranium oxide, okay? What makes that beautiful orange color is uranium. Not because it's radioactive, just a chemical property of uranium. But if I bring it near my detector, okay, it counts very fast, in fact, faster than any of those sources I had over there. And what's going on here is we've got uranium, which is an alpha emitter, um, uranium-238, and what's going on is U-238, 92 protons, 146 neutrons is decaying and emitting an alpha particle, leaving behind a nucleus that has two fewer protons, so that's going to be 90, and two fewer neutrons, that's going to be 
234, and that's the element thorium. So there are alpha particles coming out of that uh, uranium glaze. On the other hand, the chain doesn't stop there. It turns out the thorium is, is radioactive. That's annoying. Uh, the thorium is radioactive. It undergoes alpha decay, and it produces a whole chain of nuclei that along the way emit alphas, betas, and gammas. So what we're looking at right now is a combination of alpha. And so if I do my little, let's actually do that. That's a good demonstration. So if I put my piece of paper there, it hardly stops anything because although the alphas are getting stopped, the betas and gammas aren't. And I do that, same thing. And even with the lead, a lot of them are still getting through. So this re really is emitting all three kinds of radiation. Um, this is a collector's item now, okay? I bought this on eBay a few years ago. Um, if you go to the store, you'll still find Fiesta Ware being sold, but as I said, not in this color. If you go to an antique store, you might find this, and you may see nerds like me walking around with Geiger counters trying to identify the stuff that's really uranium. Uh, the antique dealers know us by now, so they're used to it. Um, the reason it's not made anymore is because although you know, the uranium glaze is pretty tough, it will flake off over time. It is a little bit soluble, and so I don't think I'd want to eat my Cheerios every day out of a bowl like this, but it's not going to kill you. Okay. Um, how many of you go camping? Okay. So you know what that is. This is a lantern mantle. Okay, if you have a gas lantern, there's a little cloth or fabric device which goes over the flame that glows. That's what actually makes the light. Uh, this is a kind of mantle which isn't made anymore either because it's impregnated with thorium, okay? Not because thorium is radioactive, but it turns out it glows a nice white glow and it makes a lot of light. But if I put this over here, okay, it counts pretty fast too. And again, thorium uh, 232 is the long lived isotope that's found in nature. It has about a billion year half life. And it undergoes a similar kind of decay to the U-238. And it has a bunch of daughters which emit alphas, betas, and gammas. So again, we've got all three kinds of radiation coming out of this thing right now. And again, it's not an enormous hazard, but you wouldn't want to eat this thing. Okay. And then finally, I think everybody probably knows what this is, a smoke detector. You probably all have it in your dorm room or your home or your apartment, whatever. Okay. And the way these all work is with a radioactive source inside. Okay. Uh, it turns out what's used in almost all smoke detectors currently being sold is a synthetic isotope, americium-241, which was first discovered up the hill here. Um, and it's an alpha emitter. Is americium-241. And I honestly don't remember what Z is, so we'll have to figure this out. I know what it decays into. It decays into Neptunium-237, and that is 93. So this must be 95. And so we can figure out that this must be what? 146? 46, is that right? Right. This has a half-life of about 400 years. So it lasts a long time, and what's going on is the alphas are being emitted from that source, and there's a little radiation detector a little ways away from it. And in between, there's air, and that air is allowed to enter the chamber through these little slits. And when there's a lot of smoke in the air, the smoke stops the alpha particles from reaching the detector, and that makes the alarm go off. Okay, so we're relying on the fact that it doesn't take much material to stop an alpha particle uh, to save people's lives. So this is a really nice application of nuclear science, I think. Um, that's in everybody's house. Okay, um, I think that's it for the demonstrations. Any questions about that?